Well, let's open up our Bibles again to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to read verses 9 through 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Now, as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your own hands, just as we commanded you, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I marvel at your wisdom. Your righteousness, your justice. Your moral excellencies. You're perfect in every way. And Lord, knowing that that is the standard by which a man is judged, it is terrifying. And yet to see in Christ our redemption, our salvation is the greatest of all reliefs. The greatest joy. Lord, that even now, the most pious among us here tonight would perish before you. Yet we have this great confidence that Christ is our high priest. And that in every area where we, where we have failed, especially in love, he has not failed. But loved you with a perfect love and loved his own until the very end. Lord, thank you for Christ. This passage would take the breath from me, Lord. Would destroy every hope of salvation. If it were not for him. Lord, please open up our hearts and minds tonight to understand. The great command. The great will of yours that we love. Lord, help us. In Jesus name. Amen. There are so many things that I could teach that I would feel at least more competent to teach. It so burdens, when, burdens me when I want to preach about something like love because it forces me when I look in the text to look in the mirror of my own life and see how small my love, how inconstant my love truly, truly is. Another thing that burdens me whenever I teach on something like love is, you know, it's like a friend of mine shared one time he was sitting behind two elderly ladies in church and the pastor got up in the pulpit and said, today I'm going to teach on faith. And the two ladies turned to one another and one of them said, huh, faith, we already know about that. It's like, no, no, you don't. If you studied faith for a hundred years, you'd still be a child in your understanding of faith. In the same way, when I stand up here and I say, you know, we need to love that word has been so romanticized in in not only in secular music, but also even in Christian music, you know, things like I'm in love with Jesus. We, we think of love as, as a feeling, as an emotion, and we don't realize that it is the deepest, most profound, most excellent of all Christian virtue. And it's beyond the grasp of every man, every woman in the faith. Apart from the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit and apart from the grace of God working in our lives. I tell you, I would feel more confident to get up here and teach astrophysics. Than I would to teach on the love of God. 
I would not be ashamed to teach on, on courage or dedication or strength of will. But it shames me to have to get up and teach on love because I fall so short of this. And please don't think that I'm just trying to be pious or humble before you. No, anyone who spends a week studying any text in the Bible about love is going to walk away. Knowing that their only hope is in Jesus Christ. Listen to me in the new covenant. Love is not a thing. It's the thing. It's the virtue. In the words of Jesus. The one who loves God with all his heart, the one who loves his neighbor as himself, has fulfilled the commands. So don't think this is just a little poetry tonight. It's not. It's the most demanding thing I could ever put before you. There's many of you who would give everything you have to the poor. There are many of you who would deliver your own body to be burned. I know you. Your youthful zeal. Real zeal, zeal, biblical zeal. But when it comes to love, I don't care who you are tonight. You're a child. You're an infant. So am I. Now, the title of this sermon is love and ambition. Now, usually these two terms don't go together, do they? But in this case, they're two sides of the same coin. We are commanded to love. And we are also to have the ambition. The strong ambition to live our lives in such a way as to be a benefit to God's people and also. To demonstrate the power of the gospel to an unbelieving world. Now, that's a mighty, a mighty thing that's been asked of us, commanded of us. To live for the benefit of God's people, to demonstrate the power of the gospel to an unbelieving world. And how can we do it except by the grace of God and the spirit of God working within us and living according to the word of God? Now, tonight, we're just going to look at one side of this coin, love for the brethren, and hopefully next week we will look at ambition with regard to living a quiet life. I know that sounds so strange, doesn't it? We're supposed to be militant. We're supposed to do all these things to change the world. But you're going to see. There's all kinds of fanatics out there and there's all kinds of exuberant activity. But what God desires are men and women who just simply do the simple things he has commanded the power of a simple and quiet life. Now, let's look at love for the brethren. Verse nine of chapter four. Now, as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Now, the conjunction, there's a conjunction here in the Greek day, and it's translated in the New American Standard as now. And what it is, it's, it's indicating to us that Paul is leaving behind his former theme that he was teaching. And what was that? Moral purity. And now he's going to take upon himself another theme. And what is it? Love for the brethren. Now, remember, this is in the context of sanctification. How do we demonstrate growth in true biblical maturity by keeping ourselves unsoiled, especially with regard to sexuality, to keep ourselves unsoiled? But then what? We're not just to walk around as prudes. We're not just to walk around as those who do not do certain things, but we're to be activated. We're to be drawn into, we're to labor with all our might in love. For the brethren, for the brethren. Now. I want to share with you something that's so very important, and this coming Sunday, I think I'm going to preach and I'm going to touch on this subject, but out of the book of first John, that what you need to understand is Love, true biblical love is. At least it seems to me in the scriptures, the greatest evidence that a person has truly been converted love for the brethren. And it is the greatest evidence that you and I are truly growing in Christ like maturity. Young man, young woman, 
Those of you who are older like me, if you want to set your sights, some of you starting out in the Christian race and you want to know where should I set my sights? Set your sights on loving as Christ loved. And if you're older like me and you think, man, I maybe need some redirection in my Christian life. Where should I look with so many good things before me? Let me let me give you this admonition. Set your sights on loving as Christ loved. I think that it would be at least. More bearable. To stand before Christ in judgment, knowing that I failed. In one area or another, but to know that I failed in love. Now, that would be a hard one, wouldn't it? Let me give you a few verses. Jesus said, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another, isn't it amazing? He didn't say the miraculous. He didn't say even eloquent or powerful spirit inspired preaching. But he said they will know that you are my disciples by the love you have for one another. That's what should amaze people about this church. And I do see that. But as we're going to see later, Paul's going to tell us, hey, don't be content. Abound, 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 go farther. John writes, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God for God is love. Are you hearing this? The one who does not love. Doesn't know God. Now, all of us. When we began our Christian pilgrimage, yes, we entered in on different levels. Some of us with more baggage than others, I suppose, more weaknesses than others. But know this, your starting point like mine may have been quite low. But if you want a litmus test as to whether or not you're born again, ask yourself, have you grown in love for the brethren? Tertullian. In the second century said this. He quotes the pagans and he says that they spoke in amazement, saying, behold, how these Christians loved one another. The pagans who who killed, who persecuted, he put on trial, who unjustly accused the one thing they could not deny is what these Christians love each other so much. And what is the thing that we most hear today against evangelicalism in the church? Hypocrisy with regard to love, lovelessness. Uncaring attitude. Now, I will give you that a lot of that is unjust, and I will also give you that a lot of it is because of the way we preach the gospel, that we have the church filled with people who have yet to be born again. But nonetheless, it is a warning to us, isn't it? That we should love. Now, the phrase here, love for the brethren, comes from a single Greek word which you'll be familiar with. Philadelphia. Philadelphia. And so phileo is, is to love. And adelphos is brother. To love our brother. Now, in the classical Greek, this term was always used with regard to the natural family, uh, physical or biological brothers and sisters. But when we get to the New Testament, we see that it is used primarily to talk about our spiritual family, the church, and to talk about our brothers and our sisters in Christ. However, even though that's true, now I want to step back and I want to make sure we understand what's being said here. I want to read a quote from Hebert. Christian love does not undervalue or disregard natural family ties. It gives them their due importance and condemns those who are without natural affection. Now, what does he mean by that? He means this. He's giving a reference basically to the super spiritual. Those who are now Christian, they belong to a certain church, maybe a very exclusive kind of of church and because of that they no longer give any due respect or any regard for their natural relationships 
in this world that are also ordained by God. That is, they neglect their physical families, immediate or extended, and they withdraw from the unbelieving world. So when we talk about our special love for our brothers and sisters in Christ, we are not approving that kind of attitude here in this church. And I want to make this clear. Why? Because of certain things that have happened recently with we've had to deal with with a, kind of some strange groups that have been teaching strange things. And we've had to help people and correct people in this matter. But also, I want you to realize there's a text in the Bible that the cults use or misuse. They distort and they do it in order to isolate their members from their natural families. And I want to just give you that text. It's in Luke 14, 26. Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, you see how certain cults, exclusive groups could use this to separate people from their families or from the unbelieving world. Now, Jesus is not promoting hatred within the context of the natural family, not at all. Jesus is not promoting hatred toward the unbelieving world or isolation from it. Paul made it very clear that although we're not of the world, we are in this world. Jesus is not doing these types of things because if he was, he would be contradicting the law of God. From which he said, not one jot or tittle would ever pass away. So what is Jesus doing? He's giving us a hyperbole. Exaggerated speech in order to press upon us a point. And what is that point? That supreme loyalty is due him. Even at the cost sometimes of the closest human relationships that we have. But he's talking about also the fundamentals of who he is and what it means to be a Christian. He's not necessarily talking about these people who will draw other people into their congregation as though they're the only congregation on the planet and separate them from everyone else. Now. I want to say this. Whenever possible. As far as it concerns you and me. Whenever it is possible, we should do everything in our power to maintain the best relationships possible with those outside the church, especially our own family, our fathers, our mothers, our brothers and our sisters. And we should seek to maintain as much as we can relationships with people in the unbelieving world. Of course, we should. But let me say this also in those relationships, though, although we are to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, when the opportunity arises, when God opens the door and we are to definitely live the Christian life before the unbelieving world without compromise. Yet at the same time, God has not caused you or called you to be the ethics sheriff. Do you understand me? He's not called you to go around correcting the entire unbelieving world. Your rules are not going to help them, especially the ones that are your inferences and don't really come out of Scripture. They don't need ethical training. They need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do You see that and they need to see it lived out in you, my friend. And what does that mean? Yes, speak the truth. But not a condemning vo voice every time you enter into a conversation with the unbelieving world, not nitpicking them every time you see them do something wrong. But showing compassion, love, grace, graciousness, Love covering a multitude of sin. And yes, even you in your holiness, bearing with their sin. When they speak wrongly before you. 
It doesn't mean every time you're supposed to correct them, but maybe you should just bear it. I know it hurts. But it is compassion. It's kindness. And it's the gospel, gospel, gospel. We must gospelize our families. We must gospelize people. Now, now that I've said that, I hope you understand it. Let me say this also. Well, I'll say it later. So let's go on now to three truths about love. Three very important truths. We're going to look at its origin. We're going to look at its practice. And we're going to look at its increase. First of all, its origin. And that can be described in one word. God. God is the origin of the brotherly love that is found in the heart of every believer. Now, he says in verse nine, you have no need for anyone to write to you. Unlike the theme of sexual immorality, the Thessalonians do not now need from Paul strong exhortation or intricate instruction with regard to love. Why is that? Why? Well, I'm going to quote Calvin here. Calvin writes, they didn't need a lot of instruction on love because love was engraved on their hearts. And therefore, there were no need of letters written on paper. Now, this is powerful. And it's going to it comes directly from the scriptures and we're going to get to there. But what I want you to see is this. When we were converted, we were not just told to love. But one of the great fruits of regeneration is that we were remade to love. It became a part of us. Now, in verse nine, again, he says, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Now, the phrase taught of God comes from a singular Greek word, and it's theodidikos. And what what does it mean? Well, theos is what? God. Didasko is to teach. And what he's saying with one singular word, you were taught of God to do this. Now, what he's let me tell you what he's not saying. He's not referring here to some teaching they had received in the past. The words of Jesus written or the preaching of Paul or some other human instrument. When he said you were taught of God, he is not talking in that context. Someone else taught you or preached to you. What he's talking about here is the supernatural work of regeneration when God wrote his laws upon your hearts. And so it's more than just God told you to love. God recreated you to love. And this is the fulfillment of the great new covenant promise that we see in the book of Jeremiah. And I'm just going to read it to you because it's such a beautiful text and it's so important. In Jeremiah 31, 33, verses 33 through 34, the Bible says this, God speaking, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. It's a covenant that goes beyond the covenant he made with Israel in Sinai. He says, I will put my law within them and on their heart, I will write it. You see, in Sinai, what happened? The people were not changed. They were not transformed. They received a stone or two stone tablets. A righteous and a just law, but externally given that they looked at and could not obey. But he says here. Put my law within them and on their heart, I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. He does an interior work that assures something. That you will be his people and you will show that you are his people. By living in obedience to his law. And how is that law summarized even by our Lord to love the Lord, our God, with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and to love our neighbor as ourself. And the one who has done this has fulfilled the law of God. Now he says they will not teach each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me. Basically, we see 
in the prophets with regard to Israel, what rampant ignorance among the people, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. God says, I'm going to cure that. And I'm going to cure it not by sending teachers all throughout my people, even though the office of teacher is a great and necessary office. He says, no, I'm going deeper than that. He says, I am going to teach them. And again, how is he going to do it? In regeneration, he writes his laws upon our heart. He says, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. You know. Someone can be converted and they can and they can at, the, at least at the beginning, not even understand how they got converted, really they're, They just know they're believing in Jesus. They can misunderstand many things about the Christian faith, but I have never met someone who was converted that when I told them God commanded them to love the church, they said, really, I didn't have a clue about that. They all knew it. As a matter of fact, when I was converted and many of you have heard your testimonies, the one thing that you realized, even though prior to your conversion, you were loveless, self-centered, everything. One of the things that immediately you knew is that you needed to love. And when you didn't show love, you needed to repent. God teaches us this. This is why love for the brethren is one of the greatest Evidences of true conversion. Now, let me say it this way. Wherever there is regeneration in the heart, we will see love in practice. Wherever someone has truly been regenerate, we will see them practicing love. Now, I don't want you to fall into a false condemnation. We can all struggle. We can all go two steps forward and five steps back. We can have those days where the grace of God is not that evident in our life. But if we are truly converted, you will see over the long haul of our lives that we are growing in love and that we are taking love seriously. In 1 John 2, 9 and 10, the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. I am amazed at how much this text parallels what Paul's going to say in verses 9 through 12. Because after speaking about brotherly love, he talks about having our ambition to live in such a way as to not be an offense. So if we truly love our brethren, we're going to live in such a way as to not be a stumbling block to our brethren or a stumbling block to the lost world. And then John comes up with exactly the same thing. See, love. True biblical love will have the greatest impact on your ethic. If you are lacking in love, I don't care how many verses you memorize or how tight you screw yourself up in order to do obedience that day. It's not going to happen. A true ethic flows from love. Now, in verse nine, again, he says, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. This verb love here is in present tense. And what does that mean? I've said this a million times during our study in first Thessalonians. Present tense indicates a continuous action, something habitual, something that is practice. It is the opposite of having something that is sporadic or having something that is based on. Well, let me put it this way. Loving because the circumstance permits it or loving because you and I are in the mood. It's constant. It's not based on factors of circumstance, but upon who we are in Christ, upon the work of the spirit in us. And what we know to be true now, the phrase one another is very important, and I want to point this out because sometimes people miss this. It denotes a mutual or reciprocating love. Now. To have a mutual love in the brotherhood, in the body of Christ, it means something that sometimes we neglect to see. 
God not only has to teach us how to give love. But he also has to teach us how to receive love. And you shouldn't just be in one of those categories all the time. If love is reciprocal, you will give it. But if love is reciprocal, you will also humble yourself and receive it. Now, I want to say this. There are some who are always giving. Always giving in the church. It's always this way. I've been in churches for more than 30 years. It's always this way. There are some who just give and give and give and give love. And usually for those people, it's also very, very hard to receive love manifested in service to them. It's very difficult. And it may be because they misunderstand, but it also could be pride. Like in Peter's case, you'll not wash my feet. Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you go to hell. Well, by all means, Lord, wash my feet, my head, my body, everything. You see, knowing love. Biblical love. Is not just you loving and giving, but you receiving. I knew a man one time. You'll never meet him, never know him. But I noticed that. He would lead. In the church and lead faithfully in the church, he would also serve faithfully in the church. But I noticed he never wanted to be on the same level as everyone in the church. He either wanted to be above as a leader or below as a servant, but he just didn't want to be a normal member who not only should give, but also receive from others. Now, there's another category. And it's not those who are always giving, it's those who are always receiving. In the body of Christ, we will have people who have great need, who at that present time are very weak. And we should be willing to help them, to love them, but we do them no good when we allow them to remain that way. I have seen people in churches that were literally like sponges. They were constantly receiving and needing love from other people and constantly complaining that the love that they received was not enough. Now, I give you those two categories because I don't want you to fall into being in those two categories. Being in one as opposed to the other. All of us should be giving love and all of us should be receiving love. And sometimes when we feel that we are strong, and there's much to give, let's give. But also when there is need, don't be ashamed to receive the kindness, and the love of others. Now, Hebert says this, you are God's pupils for this purpose, that you may be loving one another. Why has God called you into his school? Why has he taught you and continues to teach you through his spirit and through his providence? He's got you in class to learn to love. Now, let's just stop for a moment. Look at all the complexities of theology and ethics, and sometimes it's mind boggling. It's just overwhelming. You look at all this stuff and you go, how on earth am I ever going to do all these things? I don't even know what they are. OK, well, let's just reduce all that down and make it simple for you. God has one great purpose, and that is to teach you to love as Christ loved. And when you do that, everything else will fall in line. And what I mean by that is not that your life will be easy and that you will prosper. What I mean is that you will be in the very center of God's will, doing what God has commanded you in all the other things. I mean, I cannot find one thing in my life. That cannot be traced back to either love or lack thereof. It wouldn't matter. Why don't I pray as much as I should? Could it be traced back to a lack of love for God? A lack of love for my brothers and sisters in Christ who need my prayers? Why do sometimes I give in to the flesh and not want to burn the midnight oil in order to study, to preach? 
Why is it sometimes I just want to lock the door and say I'm fed up. I don't want anybody visiting me anymore forever. I'm moving to Siberia. Why is that? I can always trace it back to one thing. Lack of love. When I grumble about circumstances, it's a lack of love. So if we could get this one thing right, the other things would fall in place. We are in God's school to learn to love. Now I want to give you a text that I think is very, very applicable here. And it's Romans 5, 5. Let's just listen to it. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The love of God has been poured out within our hearts. I think that's a great example, isn't it? For you and for me. In the same way that the love of God has been poured out in our hearts, we should be active in pouring out our love into the hearts of others. As the Holy Spirit has lavished upon us the love of God, we should lavish upon others the love of God. Now look, this last phrase, lavish on others the love of God, I, I want you to know, I mean, sometimes I just, I should have told Kevin, Kevin, just bring a pistol tonight and when I say that afterwards, put me out of my misery. Just shoot me. It's painful. I don't want to sit up here and stand up here and, and present myself as, wow, did you hear him talk about that? He really understands love. No, I don't. It's painful to say these things. And I hope in a way, and I don't just want to hurt you for hurt, hurting you's sake. I hope it's painful. I hope the Spirit of God has so touched you tonight that it's painful in a way. Go, wow, I've missed it. And all my speech and all my things and all that I'm about and the complexities of my Christianity, what I'm supposed to be doing is lavishing love out. Now, men, listen to me. Here's another thing that you need to be warned about. It is much easier to lavish love on people you don't even know than the people that are closest to you, like your wife, your children. But I can tell you this. I don't care how much you serve in the community, how much you serve in the church, if you're not lavishing love in private on those who know you best, you're not lavishing love. You may be doing ministry, but I'm not really sure that you're lavishing love. Now, I want us to go out and let's go to love's practice. We spent a lot of time on on love's origin. Let's look at love's practice in chapter four, verse 10. For indeed, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. I want to look at two great truths here. First of all, love is to be practiced. And then finally, love is to be indiscriminate. Love is to be practiced. The word practice comes from the Greek word poeo, and it means to do or to work. And I think you can get the idea. We're not talking about a feeling here. Even though a feeling is part of it, what are we talking about? We're talking about action. We're talking about activity. Something is done. Now, let me just say this. Inward feelings amount to nothing. If they do not result in outward work. Subjective feelings of love amount to nothing. If they do not result in objective acts, actions and invisible love amounts to nothing if it does not lead to visible deeds. Now, the one thing that you do not want to do around here is say, I know how it looks, Pastor, but you just can't see inside my heart. I know that there's not a leader in the congregation that's going to accept that. I know it doesn't look like it, but you don't know what's in my heart. Yes, I do know what's in your heart. So does everyone else. Not because we're super spiritual or discerning or leaders or anything. It's because what's in your heart comes out of your mouth, through your hands, through your feet, in your deeds. It is manifested. It is manifested. Love has to do with doing. 
Now listen to 1 John chapter 3, 16 and 18. Now just listen to this. We know love by this. How? That he laid down his life for us. How do we know he loves us? Because he wrote us a poem. No. We know he loved us because he laid down his life. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. If we're going to walk around saying, oh, how I love the church. Well, then get ready to die. To self and to serve. Oh, how I love my wife. Well, she may want a poem every now and then and flowers are good. Maybe just putting the light bulb in the refrigerator. I don't know. She doesn't want to hear words. No one really does anymore. Because every generation, it seems that words just keep getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. We want to see what you do. What you do. Now. He says, but whoever has the world's good is goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him. How does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. He calls them little children. I mean, how would you like it? Someone walked up to you. Said, little child, listen to me. He said, I'm not a little child. Listen, when it comes to love, yes, you are. I mean, the moment I hear a man bragging about the maturity of his love, I know that he is blind. Dear friend of mine, one time a guy told him, he said, I used to really struggle with pride, but I don't struggle with that anymore. And my friend goes, you're real proud about that, aren't you? You see, when it comes to love, we will always be little children. I also want you to see that this word practice again. It's in present tense. It's an ongoing action. Practice is a very important word in the New Testament, not only for, for John in his epistles, but for all the writers. We are what we practice. We reveal what we are through what we practice, what we do, not sporadic bursts. That's why I say sometimes that the Christian life is more like a plow horse mentality, which is good for me. Instead of a fine racehorse, give me just a strong Clydesdale who's going to put one foot in front of the other and walk through a barn wall if he has to. Just this monotonous, in a way, step by step by step. It is practicing love. Now, also, love is to be indiscriminate. It says to all the brethren. Now, let's just look at the first century church for a moment. Colossians 311. What do we hear? Greek and Jew circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian and Scythian. I think we have a few of those here in our congregation. Barbarian and Scythian and slave and free man. Now, the power of the first century church wasn't in the fact that they just loved one another. That is not where the power was seen. You say, yes, it was. No, it wasn't. It wasn't just that they loved one another, but. The love that was manifested in the body. It was among members who outside of the church, outside of conversion, would have nothing to do with one another, would be and in, in fact, bitter enemies. That's what was so amazing. And so when when someone tries to start a church by reaching out to a certain demographic, like we're going to reach young people, our college people, our old people, except no one wants to reach them anymore. We're going to reach a certain demographic and bring them all together under that demographic. That's wrong. It deforms the church, demonstrates no power because they can walk in there and say, well, of course, they all hang around with each other. They're all they all got the same hobbies. They're all the same age. They've all got the same worldview in so many areas. Don't you realize that publicans and sinners, tax gatherers, Jesus said, can love that way? Didn't he say that? What's amazing is when all these people come together and you walk in there and go, man, I don't get that. These people have nothing in common. And yet look at the way they love one another. 
And in our church here, please, you know, one of the most dangerous things for all of us, all of us, no one is immune to this. These little clicks. And you know what basically they come from? Even among good people, people who really love the Lord. It's when you, in the body of Christ, you look for others that have many things in common with you. Same likes, same dislikes, same age, same hobbies. And that's what draws people together. Be, that's not wrong necessarily, but be very, very careful. What must draw us together is not that we're all the same age or that we have the same hobbies. What should draw us all together is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Do you see that now? Hebert says this, they were not allowing their personal predilections to make their love selective. True to the inner promptings of love. They are expressing their love not only to their own members, but also toward all fellow Christians throughout Macedonia. The expression implies knowledge of neighboring Christians, churches and lively communication with them. One of the things that I so love about Sunday morning is when when uh, Brother Anthony prays for other churches in our area and for other pastors. And I want you to realize that and in not just churches that are just like us. Yes, in the fundamentals of the faith. And in the the desire to have Jesus center and to love Christ, yes, there's agreement. But I, I want us to see something that is so very important here. And it's a balance. For example, we must hold to what we believe is right. Please, we must doctrinally. We must do that. But we must not allow doctrinal differences in the non-essentials to cause us to isolate ourselves from other people who, for whom Christ died. Do you see that? Yes, I will maintain my doctrinal distinctives. Yes, I will teach on it when asked. But I am not going to isolate myself from someone for whom Christ died. Someone who truly loves Christ. Now, another thing I want to warn you about. I haven't seen this, but I want to warn you about this. Don't ever roll your eyes or scoff in pride in pride. Are look down when a certain church, whether in our area or some other church is mentioned. A church that truly believes the fundamentals of the faith and has people as members who truly love Jesus. Don't scoff, don't roll your eyes just because they do not hold to some of the convictions that we may hold to. Do you understand me? Your adherence to homeschooling. Your adherence to, to simplicity in the church service. Your adherence to the way you raise your children. Or even to sovereign grace. Should never cause you to despise someone who truly loves Jesus Christ. Do you understand me? We just can't have that here. I've not seen it here, but we can't have it here. We're not going to do that. We can't do that because it's not Christian. Now, let's look at love's increase, and this is where we'll end. Chapter four, verse 10. For indeed, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. Now, although Paul acknowledged their love, that they were truly loving. Oh, that he would say the same thing about all of us. Paul was not content with the quality or the decree, the degree to which the Thessalonians were loving. He was not content. And guess what? He was not going to allow them to be content either. He wasn't going to say you arrived. Because to say someone has arrived with regard to love is to say that they now are perfectly conformed to the image of Christ. And that is not true. 
So instead of just letting them rest where they were, he parakaleoed them. That means that he called them alongside himself, basically, even though it was a letter, it's like he called them to sit down beside himself and he encouraged them. He urged them, he beseeched them and he begged them to go on with love. And what's very important is this urging, this beseeching is in present tense again. It was a common practice for Paul. Paul was commonly when he was among the brethren, he was constantly telling them, grow in love, grow in love, grow in love. Now, let me ask you a question. We might look at somebody in the church and say, uh, your dress needs to be longer or, or your you need to wear a bigger shirt or something, muscle man. We may look at someone and say, you know, you shouldn't watch that program or you shouldn't do this and shouldn't do that. And maybe all those things have some value to them, although be very, very careful. But when was the last time you walked up to someone not destroying whatever they had gained as far as love, but saying anything to promote love among them, to encourage them to go further in their love for God and their love for other people. When was the last time we did that? Because Paul did it all the time. You see? Just think about this, this great theologian, this mastermind, master builder of the Christian faith. But what do we see? He is constantly putting the priority on what so many of us think to be nothing more than spiritual milk. Love, love, love. Don't you see? Love. This is the work of the preacher. It is. So don't be angry with us. It is to exhort, encourage, beseech, beg. I'm not here to inform you. I want you to be changed because I am sick and tired of everything I know that I cannot do. Or that I don't do. I want you to grow. That's why I can use words like this. To provoke you, spur you, prod you, incite you, stir you, move you, stimulate you, motivate you, prompt you, induce you, inspire you, and impel you. All those things. Maybe I should just buy electric cattle prod. But that's what we need. That we come together as a body. Don't just look at what someone has not attained. Bless God for what they have attained and then encourage them to go further. Do you see that? Bless them and encourage them to go on, to press on to know the Lord, to press on. To demonstrate love in the body. Now, if a preacher is worth his salt, and Paul definitely was. He will find enough motivation to press on toward the prize just in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he will have a holy discontent about his own life. He will. And he will disdain mediocrity in his own life. He will hate it. And also, he will encourage you to do the same. But remember, there is a proper biblical balance. There is one sense of pressing on, not looking back, disdaining mediocrity. Not content with what we've achieved. There's that one side and then there's the other side of the coin of resting in Christ, resting in Christ. And you have to hold both of those in a wonderful biblical tension. And the only way you can do it is not by doing a word study, but by simply constantly renewing your mind in the word of God, the full counsel of God's word. Now, the verb translated to excel, peresuo, it means to go over and above to abound, surpass, overflow. Do you know, there's just nothing meager or miserly about the Christian faith, is there? It's not, most of you won't remember this, some of you will, but there was a, a hair tonic commercial when I was a little boy, a little dab will do you that you don't have to grease up your whole head, but a little dab of this stuff will fix your hair right up. A little dab will do you. A little dab does not work in Christianity. Christianity is all about lavishing, 
overflowing, excelling, bursting forth, springing up within you. It's all about that because we serve a God that has an unlimited supply of grace and power. See that? We should be a people who lavish. Not flattery, not falsehood, but something springing forth from a heart transformed, lavishing love. And again, let me say, when I say that, it's like someone took a whaler's lance and stabbed it through my heart. Now, also this excel is present tense. Constantly excelling. Isn't this amazing? Paul is constantly, present tense, encouraging them to excel. And they are to be constantly excelling. Now here's the thing. Don't you take this home and say, I'm not constantly excelling. What's wrong with me? Don't you do that. I'll come to your house. Don't do that. I'm not excelling as I should be. Praise God for Jesus Christ and his full atonement on the cross. I have hope and great promises of God. And therefore, I'm going on. I'm pressing on. I'm leaving behind what's behind and I'm pressing on to the goal. Stop all this unbiblical moping. Turn it over to Christ. Stand back up again and keep walking. Because his grace is good. His grace is is sure. Now, Hebert says this in the practice of love, believers can never sit back and feel that they have done enough. Love must always be stretching out after a closer approximation to the divine standard of love. And where is that found in Christ? In Christ. You see, here's the thing. We have been given a task in which, in one sense, we are always going to fail. Do you realize that? Because the standard is so high. But you don't look at the failure. He took care of the failure on the cross. What you look at is the progress. What you look at is the progress. Someone says to me, Paul, after 30 years, you're not everything you should be. And I say, if you knew me before I was converted, Instead of criticizing, you'd be getting down on your hands and knees and praising God for the power he's demonstrated in my life. Not that I'm that good now, but I was that bad then. You see that? Now, I want to give you a parallel text, and this is where we'll finish. I love this text. In 1 John 2, 7 and 8, Beloved, I am writing, not, I, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. This is the part I love. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. It's like, OK, John, which is it? You're spooking me a little bit. It's not a new commandment. It's an old commandment. But then it is a new commandment. John, what are you trying to tell me? It's the most amazing thing he is telling us. He's saying love is an old commandment. Ever since the beginning, the commandment has been love. You find the commandment of love. In Leviticus. In the Old Testament, in the law, God has always been a God of love, immutably, eternally a God of love, and he has always demanded from us love. Love is an old commandment. Well, then how is it a new commandment? Because when Jesus Christ came to this earth and he lived and died on that cross, he gave us such a radically empowered, infinitely greater definition of love than any law could ever give us. His expression of love was so great, it's though it had never been given before. His love was so great, it's though no one ever knew about love before until he came. His love eclipsed every word about love, every example of love. His love eclipsed it. Guess what? You've been called to do that. Not just. Tithe your 10 percent, do your duty. If you find somebody's donkey loose in a field, well, don't shoot it. 
No, it's a whole new thing. It goes so far beyond all the demands that we see in the Old Testament. It is to live your life as Christ lived his. As a sweet smelling offering to God. To live your life as Christ lived his dying to self. And giving self. Giving away self to others. And don't think it's some type of monastic drudgery that we're talking about here. Is it not true that every time you have served self and been stingy? And what I mean there is, is with your life and with your love, you have been stingy. Have you not walked away in utter drudgery? And yet every time you have lavished love on someone else, no matter how costly that love, is it not true that your feet weren't even touching the ground? You were so full of joy, so full of contentment and peace. Do you see that? It's not teaching self-denial. He's not telling us to simply give and pour ourselves out in love just so we can do our duty. This is the way of life. This is what you were made for. This is why he put you in school. To teach you to love. Now. I have had young men tell me in preaching, I can't preach that. Because I'd be a hypocrite if I preached that. Well, I can tell you before God. I want to do this. I want to be an honest man. I want to love as Jesus loved. But I can also tell you, I'm not a hypocrite in preaching this. I'm striving for the goal. Yeah, but you haven't even got close. No, I haven't even got close, but I've said that, haven't I? You see, we oftentimes have to preach a standard. That we ourselves fail. It's not hypocrisy. It's our duty. It's hypocrisy when we try to pretend that we've arrived when we haven't. So I'm not. Well, let me show you a little something about preaching. If the truth were coming forth from me as the author of it and then telling you what you must do without any concern for my own duty, that would be hypocrisy. But if I preach this way. Saying, did you hear what he just told you and me? Well, let me ask you tonight, did you hear what he just told you? And me. Now. Will you pray for me? And can I pray for you? Can we take a look at how serious this matter is? You, you young people and your brother as brothers and sisters, you're at home. And you fight and you claw and you do all this thing. Listen to the word that's been spoken here tonight. Husband and wife. Gnawing. At each other at times. Listen to the word. That has been spoken here tonight. Brothers and sisters in Christ. Who although not against each other. Yet sort of negligent of each other. Listen to the word. That has been spoken here tonight. And my greatest prayer for you. That you suffer with this text. As much as I have. In the last few days. Because it has done me good. The wounds. Of a friend. Are of greater value. Than the caresses and kisses. Of someone not brave enough to tell you the truth. Let's pray.